Okay, hello there and welcome to the College of Southern Idaho, the Evergreen Building, uh, the geology classroom where I spend a lot of my time. And we are going to continue our next video series in the Rocks with Wilsey series, look, focusing on rock types and how to identify rocks and hopefully good helpful tips that will help you as you're looking at rocks out there on your own. Remember, you can, uh, if you like these videos, you can always help out by either clicking on the donate button at the top of the YouTube page or underneath every video description, uh, there's a PayPal link and some other information there. So let's get right to it. This is gonna be our last uh, video on igneous rocks. And then from this point forward, uh, the plan is to focus our attention on the sedimentary rocks. So we'll probably do a, a video focusing on the sedimentary rocks, kind of an introduction to those rock types. Uh, and then uh, we'll start looking at specific uh, sedimentary rocks one at a time. But today we're gonna focus on uh, three rocks that I think a lot of people know, um, and to some degree they're pretty easy to identify, although we'll see there can be some subtle differences or um, another rock type you might confuse with each of these. So we're going to look today at pumice, obsidian, and tuff. These are three extrusive igneous rocks, so these are rocks that erupt from volcanoes. Uh, they come to some degree from different types of volcanoes, although there's some commonalities, so we'll We'll look at that and um, we'll see how these kind of compare to each other because I think these three rocks have a lot of um, a lot to tell us. Remember that our main goal here is to not just be able to identify rocks but to determine the story. So every rock has a story. That's something that uh, we need to remember and that our job hopefully is not just identifying the rock which is which is fun and nice and gives us something to kind of uh, hang our hat on, but uh, but more importantly, looking at the story behind the rocks and what the rocks can tell us about uh, Earth's history at that period of time. So let's start with our first rock, which is Tuff, T-U-F-F. Um, this is a rock that is, in terms of its texture, we went over igneous rock textures. So this has a pyroclastic texture, mean, meaning it's totally made out of ash. So volcanic tuffs are composed dominantly of ash. And ash is just a particle size. It's less than two millimeters in size. So if the particles are, are less than two millimeters by and large and they're ash, um, then you're probably looking at a tuff. Now where a tuff can get confusing is it can look a lot like some fine-grained sedimentary rocks, like a fine-grained sandstone, uh, maybe even a mudstone potentially. And we'll get to that when we get to the sedimentary rocks, but what you would wanna do is look closely at those particles, which would probably necessitate um, you know, some sort of uh, a hand lens or uh, some sort of uh, something that gives you some magnification. And what you'd want to do is look at those particles and see if they look like ash particles or if they look like uh, little grains of, of rock fragments. So maybe rounded or maybe not rounded, but just, you know, broken rock fragments. So remember to make ash, there's a fundamental process involved here. We have to basically have an explosive eruption that actually is fragmenting and shredding the lava into little tiny pieces. So just having ash in a rock lets you know that the process is involved. Part of the story was one of explosive conditions where we were actually had so much gas present in the magma or locally that we were able to break apart the lava. So it's explosive, um, like a bomb going off, off, if you will. You might ask, well, what happens if the rock is, you know, pyroclastic, it, it forms by particles breaking during an eruption, but what if it's larger than this, this criteria we have here? Well, then we sometimes call that a volcanic breccia. We'll come back to this word when we use it in a sedimentary context, but if you have larger particles in your volcanic rock um, and it's dominated by those, then you might use this term here. But we're gonna stick with tough because that's the, the little bit more common one here. Um, so tufts can be either hard or soft, depending on how much welding occurs. If you can imagine ash accumulating in an environment as it sort of stacks up on top of itself, and if it still retains a lot of heat, that can actually allow it to weld into a more cohesive, compact, and more dense type of rock. So some tufts are soft. You can just uh, wipe the ash particles with your, th with your thumb and your fingers. Other ash or tufts will tend to be much more hard and resistant. Um, this isn't the same as another word you hear out there, tufa. 
Um, and these are actually confused a little bit on the internet and other places. So this is a type of limestone. This is a, a sedimentary rock made out of calcite. We'll, we'll probably tackle this when we get to sedimentary rocks, but even though the spelling is very the same, uh, bear in mind that a tufa and a tuff are totally different processes and totally different rocks. So what kind of environments might we be able to accumulate ash in? Well, either ash can fall out of the sky during explosive eruptive events as the eruption drives the ash up into the atmosphere. Eventually that driving pressure wanes and dissipates and so that ash can then fall back to earth and that's what we would call an ash fall tuff if it's just ash that's accumulated falling out of the atmosphere. Or we might get a tuff that forms when ash is actually flowing along the, the earth's surface, kind of like an avalanche of hot ash and rock and debris, and we sometimes call those surges or pyroclastic flows. I've done some videos on those uh, Yellowstone and a couple around Southern Idaho, so we've talked about that process a little bit before. In terms of composition, um, most of our tufts are gonna be felsic to intermediate. So if you remember what composition means, um, that's gonna indicate that they're gonna tend to be a lot lighter in color. And so they would be rhyolitic to andesitic in composition. So they're gonna tend to be light grays, pinkish, um, that sort of thing. But realize that you can have basaltic tufts, mafic tufts. It's a lot less common because we know that mafic magmas tend to erupt non-explosively, but you can get a basaltic tuff if that <clears throat> magma or lava is interacting with water or in some cases ice. So if you get that kind of interaction between the lava and the water, you can create explosive conditions where uh, a tuff might form. So let's look at some, some rocks here. Uh, but let's start with maybe looking at a little bit of ash. I'm sure you've all seen ash before, but just to give you a little bit of context, it's essentially like flower-like consistency. I can feel a little bit of grit between my, my thumb and forefinger here, um, but this is incredibly fine material. Um, it looks pretty innocuous. It doesn't look, you know, it, it looks like possibly dough or something like that, or flour, I suppose, but um, this is actually nasty stuff. Uh, ash, when it's inhaled in your lungs can mix with the moisture in your lungs uh, can set up like concrete you can become asphyxiated uh, it's main mainly made out of since it's mainly felsic it's mostly silica in composition so it can have long-term health effects on your lungs so the point is that nasty stuff to breathe in um, you wouldn't want to expose yourself to breathing in a lot of ash over a long period of time but let's look at some different types of tough um, i think i want to start with i have got three right here and this one here, this one, and another one over here that all came from the same area, but I think they can teach us some cool lessons. And I hope I have them in the right order. I didn't mark them, but just looking at them, I think I've got them in the right order. Where these rocks came from was in Eastern California, east of the Sierra, is a place near Bishop called Owens River Gorge. And Owens River Gorge is a spectacular setting to see a thick exposure of volcanic tuff from the Long Valley, Long Valley caldera that erupted um, about 760,000 years ago. And um, as you start down the grade there, you can walk the old road down into, um, into the canyon, you'll see that the tuff near the top um, has, you know, crystal particles in here. Let's see what we can find. There's a nice little crystal. If I can get that, there we go. There's a nice crystal of quartz. Um, in it, but you can also see there's fragments in here, right? We've got just chunks. So not only do we have crystals, but we have fragments and chunks of other things. The other thing we have are these kind of creamy colored materials here with, with kind of this fibrous nature in them. It's a little hard to tell just by looking at this piece, but these are actually fragments of pumice. There's another nice quartz crystal over here. Um, and so the point here is to just to look at the general texture of this rock. Even though it has chunks of other things in it, it's dominated by the ash, which is kind of the, the, the background kind of grayish pink color here. And so that's what qualifies this as, as a tuff. But as you walk down Owens River Gorge, um, you're walking into sections of the ash that um, are deeper in the pile. And so they were compacted more by the heat and the weight of the ash above. And so then you see um, ones that maybe look like this, where there's actually, again, not just crystals, a lot of these irregular pieces here, these are pieces of pumice again. Notice I can kind of scrape it away so it's a little bit soft. Um, we still see some crystals in here. 
in places uh let's see where's a nice one looks like there's one right there nice little quartz crystal coming through um, so it looks highly fragmented but in places you can also see around some of these fragments uh, kind of a little halo and these are thermal um, alteration effects so basically this ash was so hot that these particles that maybe weren't hot to begin with maybe these were just chunks of rock carried up to the surface by the eruption um, actually developed some of these uh, little halos around them as well but the point here is maybe seeing that some of the the particles are a little more squished we're seeing a lot more elongated and flattened particles in here even though we do have some that are kind of randomly oriented and then by the time we get to this one here which would represent the rocks you see at the bottom of uh of the owens river gorge Let's zoom out a little bit um, what you can hopefully see here is that the particles are even much more compacted and in fact so much so that the a lot of the pumice is even flattened as well and just these little glassy lenses are kind of all you get in here um, we still get crystals so we can still see some of the original crystals in here um, but the idea here was to see with these three rocks just from welded this rock as i feel it my hands is incredibly uh, hard and resistant if i go back to the first one here uh, it's a little bit softer i can kind of scrape off yeah a little bit of a little bit of the material here with my finger and so from you know you can see the degree of welding here with these three was kind of the idea in showing you those from owens river gorge um, let's look at a couple others i just grabbed randomly here's uh one from a core so this is a drilled core uh, but this also nicely shows some of the crystals in here. Um, looks like we've got one there. Try to catch the light just right. Yeah, a couple little crystals in here. Again, you can kind of see the fine gray nature. This is like a typical tough here, kind of light gray. Again, we might get some other particles of rock entrained in the ash, especially if it's an ash flow tough. Even if it's an ash fall tough, you might just have rocks sitting on the ground. Uh, they get incorporated and maybe melt, or not melted, but welded in with the tough as well. Um, again, this one's kind of, they're not always soft, so don't take that as a, a cardinal rule, but you can see how powdery the residue is on my hand there. So this one also feels a little gritty and powdery because the ash particles are coming off. Same thing with this one here. This one actually feels a little bit light uh, to the touch. This is a much more fine-grained ash. And again, the, the trick you're gonna have in determining, let me put that down. If I can zoom in without holding it, give you a little better view. Um, determining if these are sandstones or, or ash tufts is going to be to get a good look, more, more um, magnification than I can provide with my camera right now, but get a really close look at this stuff and see if the particles look like um, little shards of, of glass and what we call ash particles, which you'd expect them to be various shapes um, if you see a lot of rounding in the rock, that's probably indicating it's some sort of um, uh, sandstone or, or, or mudstone or some sort of sedimentary rock. Realize too that you can have, it can get messy because you can actually have ash sized particles incorporated in a sandy environment. So there's some ash and some sand. Uh, so we sometimes call those rocks tuffaceous sandstone. So it's, it's, it has the tough particles in it, but, it's, uh, but it also is made out of sand or sand sized particles in a sedimentary environment. So. We'll get to that more maybe when we uh, talk about sedimentary rocks. Um, what else? Um, another one here, uh, this one showing, again, some of the crystallization. Um, this is a more welded tuff as well. Looks like that might be a nice crystal of, might be a biotite, I can't quite tell. Uh, let's see what else we've got in there. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit of biotite in there. I can see some of those black crystals flashing. Looks like there's another crystal of quartz right there, catching the light. Remember those cleavage planes? So that's our way to maybe identify a few minerals. Um, so all of these tufts I've showed you are felsic, maybe a little bit intermediate, but mainly felsic in composition. Um, I had to go outside and look for the only uh, piece of basaltic tuff that I, I had. And I apologize, it's not the best one, um, but this is a basaltic tuff, um, black, kind of grainy, um, it's probably got some of this yellowish orange material in here. This is something called pelagonite. This is common when we get ma basaltic magma interacting with, with water. Um, it forms this byproduct called pelagonite um, in it. So I don't know if I have a whole lot of cool things to show in this rock, but just letting you know uh, what a 
a basaltic tuff might looks like might look like uh, and that they're they're possible as another type of tuff out there a couple particles of maybe whoops oh, camera, sorry um, larger chunks embedded in it maybe as well uh, but there you go just another example of a different type of tuff so so there's our tufts let's move on to um, our next two rock types and so we're going to focus on uh, obsidian and pumice so these actually even though they look totally different and i'll go ahead and give you a quick visual here uh, in case you aren't familiar with these too much um, everyone knows obsidian black shiny right and then this one here is um, is uh, pumice and so this one here and this one actually have quite a bit in common um, and so we're gonna kind of look at both of these real quick this is these are actually technically both made out of the same stuff so if you take obsidian and pumice even though they look really different um, if you grind these up into a powder they're actually the same composition this is the same material uh, the exact same composition one to another um, but yet they look so different so they're both felsic they're both glass in terms of what they're made out of so let's start with obsidian uh, obsidian is kind of an odd duck because we stick it with the igneous rocks but really it's not a rock because it's not made out of minerals and it's not really a mineral because it doesn't have um, ordered structure with uh, with the crystals in it, it doesn't even have crystals uh, or any crystallization whatsoever. So I guess you could call it a mineral Lloyd, although that's kind of a stretch too. But for whatever reason, we've decided to stick it with the igneous rocks, probably primarily because it forms with volcanic environments and because it has that association with volcanoes and magma, um, it makes the most sense to stick it here. So realize that classification systems aren't perfect. They always break down at some point. So obsidian has no crystals. It has no, so, you know, what minerals are in obsidian? None. It has no minerals. It doesn't have quartz. It doesn't have mica. It doesn't have olivine um, because all the elements in it are unordered and kind of random. And again, it has this glassy texture for which it's known for. Obsidians are always felsic in composition, even though they're dark in color, and we learned that color was a good guide to determining composition. This is one notable exception where the color does not help you. The color does not um, lend anything to understanding the composition of the parent magma material. So obsidian actually is only from felsic magmas. Basalts and mafic magmas do not form obsidian. When lava runs down the hill in Hawaii and goes into the ocean and cools very quickly, it is not creating obsidian. Um, so where does the dark color come from? It's just uh, small impurities of iron give it its sort of darker color, uh, which is kind of interesting. So again, kind of an odd duck, this obsidian. Um, usually as an eruptive product, we see obsidian forming it's always a lava flow, so it's not material thrown up into the sky as tephra or what we sometimes call pyroclastic material. Obsidian is always associated with some type of flow of lava. Usually it takes place near the end of an eruption when the residual magma is <clears throat> cooler in temperature, going to the next bullet point, and lower in water content. So if it's got more water content in it, it's going to tend to make rhyolite and rhyolite lava flows than versus obsidian. So you've got to basically get uh, the water drained out of the magma. It's what we call like dewatering or kind of what we call a dry magma to form obsidian. And that temperature has got to be low, not too low uh, so that it crystallizes, but right near the, uh, the, the low part of its, um, or the upper part of the, the crystallization spectrum. And then one interesting about obsidian <clears throat> is over time, it doesn't do well. It doesn't last. It actually, what we call de-vitrifies, or if you want to call it deglassifies. basically it's characteristic glassy composition or texture um, changes over time. It absorbs moisture in the atmosphere. It takes that water into its structure and it starts to actually create crystals. So even though it doesn't have crystals initially, it can actually develop crystals over time. And because true obsidian then um, doesn't have these crystals and over time it de-vitrifies or basically the glass breaks down because it's um, not stable, there essentially is no such thing as old obsidian. All the obsidian you've ever seen is, oh shoot, probably younger than like, let's say 20 million years or so. There's, so there's no way you'll find a beautiful chunk of, um, you know, 
you know, 400 million year old obsidian because it will have already devitrified into uh, rhyolite or something similar. Um, as it becomes hydrated over time, it starts to develop little crystals, and we sometimes call that snowflake obsidian, that type of obsidian. Um, but those little, those little snowflakes in there are actually uh, called spherulites. So let's go ahead and jump to uh, obsidian. Let me move some of my rocks around here, and then we'll come back and, and look at pumice. So here's a nice classic obsidian here. You can see the black glassy um, luster. You can also see one of the characteristics of the obsidian that makes it such uh, an important material for making tools in primitive cultures are these curved um, fractures that run through it. This is called conchoidal fracture. And because it breaks along these curves, um, it allows uh, someone with the skill to actually pressure, break this with pressure called pressure flaking and start to shape it and form these really sharp edges here. Um, you can actually see it's becoming a little bit more, let me zoom in a little bit, more uh, translucent over here. You can actually start to see through it when it's in a little bit thinner pieces. And again, you can see how it kind of breaks here and forms these, uh, these sharp edges here. So it's a pretty nice piece of obsidian here. Of course, we talked a little bit about some of the color you can get in obsidian. So this is a piece of obsidian with a lot of the kind of reds in it. This is what's called pumpkin obsidian. Um, so the iron here is partially already oxidized. So it gives it some of that nice color, uh, kind of reddish, brown, orange color. Uh, similar piece here with just sort of a, a little cool concentric band of the more oxidized iron in the center uh, of the obsidian piece there. So another another chunk there. It's got a little bit more of it on the back side. But the, I'd say these first three here are just classic obsidians. Um, here is what obsidian looks like when it's just barely starting to uh, devitrify a little bit. So if we zoom in here, um, hopefully you can see that it's starting to form, the glare's a little rough here, but it's starting to form little specks. There's little white specks. I don't know if I can try to get that closer. Yeah, you might see it's got a, a few of these little specks running through it as well. Uh, and these are these kind of developing spherulites. You can still see up here uh, the conchoidal fracture pattern that's still forming, but it's hitting, as it's hitting some of these little tiny uh, well, these are actually crystals in here, these little specks, these little crystals, um, it's not as glassy. In fact, when I rub the, 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 this metal tip on the obsidian, it, it moves and slides very easily because it's so glassy, but when it hits one of these obstructions, it's actually kind of sticky there. And there's another one right there. So these are actually crystallization points within the, the, the rock. So this is an obsidian that's starting to de-vitrify. It's starting to crystallize a little bit. I'm not a flint napper, but I would guess this stuff would not be as good a material uh, as this stuff I showed you uh, right off the bat here. This really nice uh, material here. So, um, and then over time, it can actually become uh, full on snowflake obsidian where you can see these fairy lights forming that kind of uh, have these crystallization points that kind of radiate out from around them. Um, so this is a good example of, of snowflake obsidian or a de-vitrifying um, obsidian. Uh, you can also see how weathered the surface is here, that it's kind of looking a little bit, this is what it would look like on the surface. Um, so as you're, if you're looking for this stuff, you know, that's what it's gonna look like. It's not gonna be typically super shiny and awesome and, unless you break it open with a rock hammer and then you'll see some of the more um, kind of characteristic look there. And then I have one more obsidian that's kind of odd, um, and I can't remember, a student brought this into me, and now I can't remember where it came from, but I think it's somewhere in Southern Idaho. This is what it looks like on the outside, um, kind of an unremarkable dark rock with these, um, it looks like the little conchoidal fracture lines are partially filled in with, with some sort of material. I haven't given this a ton of scrutiny, um, but what's fun about this rock is when you break it open, so here it is again on, on the outside. Uh, but when, when you break it open, you can see it, it is obsidian, um, but it also has a lot of, again, those specks in there. So it's a, a partially, uh, or it's starting to de-vitrify a little bit. So uh, pretty cool. Um, let's go to our last rock type, and that is pumice. So pumice is just the same as obsidian, but now imagine obsidian that's just incredibly 
infused with gases, so it's kind of frothy and foamy. Um, so this is essentially a gas-rich obsidian. That's what pumice is. Um, it's going to tend to have, oh, it's a typo here. This should be vesicular. Just switch the I and the S. Sorry about that. Uh, vesicular, remember vesicles are the gas bubbles, so it's going to have a lot of these gas bubbles. It's going to be typically really light in color because it has very thin walls between adjoining vesicles. Uh, pumice sometimes might have crystals, sometimes not. It just depends on if there was some crystallization of that magma that took place before eruption. Um, pumice, unlike obsidian, gets thrown out of the volcano into the air. So this is usually the beginning of the eruption. The more gas-rich, explosive phase of the eruption will tend to form uh, pumice. And then this is going to come from our, our, our laundry list of naughty volcanoes, right? So stratovolcanoes, maybe caldera-forming eruptions, lava domes, these are, these are the, the suspects we'd expect to form uh, pumice. And so let me come back to our, our final group of rocks here, but I wanna actually make the connection a little stronger with um, obsidian. And let me pick up, yeah, that side's good there. So there's a nice piece of obsidian. And now I'm gonna put a chunk of pumice on top. And I want you to think of this um, as the same material. In fact, think about when you pour a mug of, let's say, root beer, or it could be an adult beverage. Um, but you've got the liquid of root beer down below, which does have some gases in it, but is dark, syrupy, has a sugar and yummy tasting stuff in it. But sitting above that root beer, um, just as you pour it, is the foam, right? The froth, the head of the root beer or the beer. Um, and that's kind of like what happens in these magma chambers. The gas-rich portion of the magma chambers is um, sitting above the more dense gas pour portion of the magma chamber. And so as the gas rich stuff is driven out of the volcano, uh, so this pumice is gonna go flying out of the volcano, collecting along the sides. And then later we might get this uh, gas pour felsic magma oozing out of the volcano to form the obsidian flow. And so these can form from the same eruption. And so, I don't know, I think that's a nice little um, analogy there. So think about when you're, next time you're pouring a big mug of root beer or uh, an adult beverage. Uh, root beer works better because it's kind of similar color. Um, think of that with the foam and the froth up above, that's the pumice. And then the more dense gas pour uh, liquid down below, that would be like the obsidian. So, so a couple pieces of uh, pumice here to kind of conclude. Um, so here's one, this one I remember I collected from the salt and sea area. Uh, in Southern California. So this, you won't be able to tell this in the video, but this is incredibly light. Uh, as you well know, pumice will float on water. Um, it uh, is, has all sorts of uses. Because it's made out of glass, it's very abrasive. So as I rub this with my finger, it feels rough. It's used to clean things in your house. You can scrape off the, the rough spots on your feet. It's used industrially as, as, a, as an abrasive as well. But the point is it just has so many holes, so many vesicles in it, and that's what make it, makes it so lightweight. Uh, here's a little bit different color, but also, let me zoom out a little bit so you can see that. This is from Southern Idaho, about 40 minutes north of Twin Falls, uh, near Magic Reservoir. Uh, so another piece of uh, pumice. They actually quarry this pumice in smaller pieces, uh, probably crush it a little bit too. And it's also used on the infield of some of the baseball and softball fields in our community. Um, so it's also used outside sort of as a, a landscaping rock in different applications. Um, so you can see some of the holes there. Um, here's one, this one, I think this one's from just outside Yellowstone, but this one you can actually see, put it down so you can see it a little better. This one actually should have some, got my little pointer, lots of crystals in it. So we can see some of these crystals of quartz in it. Uh, actually, this one has quite a few crystals in it. If you kind of just kind of keep looking as I rotate it in the light, you can see a lot of these crystals in there. There's one down here at the bottom. Uh, there's another big one right there. I think that was a crystal anyway. That might just be a shiny section. But nonetheless, you can see some of the crystals in here as well. Um, this one's from the, Oh, which eruption from Yellowstone was this? This might be, don't quote me on this, this might be the Mesa Falls Tuff, which is the 1.3 million year old uh, eruption. So another, another lovely piece of pumice, again, kind of abrasive. Um, and then these last ones here are kind of fun. This one actually shows 
the bubble walls so you can see uh, these vesicles, these gas bubbles in here and the, the walls between them and then just sort of the glassy but also the, the sticky uh, viscous nature of this material. Um, and then there's areas in here where it's a little bit more rhyolitic so it just forms these kind of gray gray bands in here in between these more uh, pum pumice-like you can see these bubbles kind of getting stretched right in here. Um, this is a pretty cool piece here. I believe I got this from, oh, Eastern Sierra's Long Valley Caldera area once upon a time. There's some of the bubble walls there. And this one was in the collection. I'm assuming this one is real, but it could be man-made glass. But it, nonetheless, it just shows sort of the, the texture with the, the bubble walls. And in this case, the bubble walls are really thin. Uh, which makes them translucent to, to transparent to some degree. Um, but again, just kind of a big piece of foam, just a, a big piece of uh, foamy glass, if you will. That's pretty much all this, this pumice stuff is. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully you learned a few things. Uh, we covered tough, we covered obsidian, and we covered a couple samples here of pumice, uh, learning their stories, their history, how they're related to each other and to igneous rocks. So for now, thanks for joining me here at the College of Southern Idaho. We're gonna close the chapter on our igneous rock series and we will do our next one next week. We will start an introduction to sedimentary rocks uh, and we'll explore the wonderful world of sedimentary rocks. So thanks so much for your time. Enjoy your day and we'll see you next time.